want to try to convince you about uh, the speed of light the particles traveling faster than the speed of light. Uh, the question is, which velocity? Which velocity arises from the fact that we live in a Euclidean space, but the space in which relativity unfolds is hyperbolic space. And this was known from the 1900s, that there, there was two effects. One is the uh, is stellar aberration, which was known from 1725 by Bradley, and the other effect was the Fitzhugh experimental effect. This goes back to 1800, when people thought that there should be an effect of the ether upon optical phenomena. And uh, Fresnel came up with a formula for the drag of ether, that is, as a system moves through a medium like water, there should be a drag of ether moving, it absorbs ether and it re emits ether. And the uh, formula that Fresnel came out with is N is the index of refraction, which is greater than 1. You would have C equals C over N plus B, 1 over 1 minus N squared. Okay? If the system were just additive, this factor would be unity. And I would just have the regular addition law. So somehow, the ether drags. It produces a smaller effect. Okay? And this was shown by Einstein and Van Rohe to arise from the formula of the relativistic addition law, which is due to Poincaré. If you introduce the velocity w is equal to c over n, expand the denominator, you come out with uh, c prime equals c over n plus v 1 minus 1 minus n squared. Where this is the Fresnel drag coefficient. This was carried out about 20 years later by Fitzhugh, 1850s, and it was shown that this held. But it was due not to ether drag, but to the fact that the relativistic law of addition, okay, of velocities. The second phenomenon has to do with aberration, okay? Aberration occurs when two systems are in relative motion, and they're looking at a certain star. The telescopes will be oriented in a different fashion, not in the same direction, due to the motion. We see this every time you stop under a shower, rain shower, in a car. The water drops come down perpendicular. You start to move, and it seems like the water is coming at you. So this phenomenon of aberration was known since 1725 by Bradley. Actually, Bradley was looking for the parallax to measure the distance between the Earth and distant stars. Okay? But he found instead uh, aberration. So uh, the two frames differ by this effect. So if I take a rocket ship with a velocity v1 and another rocket ship with a velocity v2, I form a triangle from a distant star, and if Euclidean geometry held, the perpendicular at a zero angle, and these two would be right angles. <coughs> but due to the phenomena of aberration, the sum of these two angles is less than 180 degrees. Okay? And that's a phenomena of non Euclidean geometry. Triangles, the sum of triangles is less than 180 degrees. How does this arise? Let's assume that V2 is at right angle. That implies that if the sum is less, this has to be an acute angle. Okay? Now, in 1829, Nicholas Lobachevsky came up with the fact that 
Euclid had five postulates for Euclidean geometry. And the fifth postulate was, through a point, I can draw only one line parallel to another line. There's only one parallel, okay? And Lobachevsky came out with the fact that in his geometry, you can have more than one line parallel, meaning not touching another line. The parallel postulate was avoided. So, and in this geometry, he showed that all the other postulates of Euclid held. So, this is called the angle of parallelism, this angle here. And it depends only upon the distance between the two rocket ships. And it's an acute angle. As, you become, as it becomes 90 degrees again, you get Euclidean geometry. But due to the motion, distortion, it creates a, a system in which hyperbolic geometry holds. So, uh, this was uh, another uh, example of where hyperbolic geometry comes in. There was a concerted effort to avoid all these uh, effects and treat it as Euclidean geometry because, according to Poincaré, this was the most convenient geometry. So, when I said that we have two possibilities for velocity, in this world, hyperbolic world, I have, in our world, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Here, the shortest distance between two points is a curved circle inwards, normal at the borders, okay? The people that live in this world see a much different thing than we do. They don't see things bent. They see things straight. As they move closer to the borders, they begin to shrink. And with the, the, their uh, rulers shrink, and their clocks go slower, but they can't tell any difference. So the borders to them seem infinitely far away. And they see no, they see no distortion on their own bodies or on the measuring sticks. Okay? Now one of the things that Euclidean geometry is, it's relative. That means angles, I can have two similar triangles. Same angles, different sizes. This is not possible in hyperbolic geometry. The angles are absolute and they determine the lengths. So there's no such thing as similar triangles. This depends upon the fact that there's a universal constant, uh, an absolute constant for hyperbolic geometry. When I said that uh, Euclidean geometry is relative, it means that I need a bureau of standards to tell me what a meter is. We all measure things in kilometers. But what is a kilometer? I can define it any way I want. If the bureau of standards com disappeared completely, I would have no means of reconstructing that meter or seconds. These are conventions. Such conventions don't exist in hyperbolic geometry. It depends upon the radius of curvature and a, constant, a universal constant. And when Einstein or Poincaré elevated C to a universal constant, what he was doing was changing the system from Euclidean geometry to a hyperbolic geometry. So, according to Lobachevsky, the velocity would be given by the hyperbolic tangent of E over C. This is a straight line in Lobachevsky space. So if I plot the hyperbolic tangent, it gets something like this. This is C, and this is the uh, bar. Okay? So V, RV velocity, goes from 0 to C at the same time that the velocity in hyperbolic space goes from 0 to infinity. So, in effect, when someone observes something, it depends upon which velocity he's looking at. Whether the velocity is really a Euclidean velocity or whether it is a hyperbolic velocity. Now, as far back as 18, some 1820 or something like that, Gauss, the prince of mathematicians, wanted to find the effect. So he went to southern Germany 
and uh, geometrists measure distance by triangulation. And he wanted to measure the distance on three mountaintops and sum the angles and to see if it was 180 degrees or it was different from 180 degrees. Okay? His apparatus was not that sensitive to measure that. If instead you take the sun as one vertex, Mars as another, and Earth as another, this becomes a trillion times larger than what uh, Gauss was trying to measure. Okay? And if there is a deviation of one degree, it would have meant 10 to the minus 12th of a degree in Gauss's system, which is so small that it would go unnoticeable. So what Lopachevsky did was look to the heavens to see if, it is, uh, if the geometry of the universe is really Euclidean or is it hyperbolic. So he tried to, what he tried to do was to measure parallax. Parallax depends upon the position of the star, of, 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 the, of the planet. That is, we see, going around the Earth, every six months, we observe a planet. And that planet is not stationary, but it seems to oscillate in a circle. And the parallax would be the annual oscillation of the apparent position of the star due to the Earth's motion. Okay? And what Lobachevsky tried to do was to put a lower bound on parallax. Here we're talking about astronomical systems, but it's so, the effect is so small that it would be it was impossible to measure. So this is one place, uh, two elements in which the, uh, the originators of relativity should have known that it was not Euclidean space they were looking at, but hyperbolic space. And they knew it. As far back as 1909, Summerfield derived this relation. This relation, if I take this, the double angle formula, or the difference of two angles, this becomes hyperbolic tangent of A minus hyperbolic tangent of B over 1 minus That, that is nothing but this with a sign change. Okay? He knew that. But it was repressed. In 1908, when Planck was giving his Columbia lectures, he came out with a statement that hyperbolic geometry is child's play in comparison to the, uh, to the weight that relativity puts upon the mind. This was his way of completely pushing out relativity, a hyperbolic geometry. This was noticed in 19, uh, 1910 by another German, Kaluza, who studied uniform motion of a rotating disk, accelerating disk. And he came up with a formula which looked quite like that of uh, Beltrami, which was the metric uh, in hyperbolic space of constant curvature. Kaluza uh, was supposed to attend the conference, became sick, and just published a one-page uh, note on this. The upshot of this was that if I set the circle in motion, okay, the circumference of the circle would not be 2 pi r, but it would be greater than 2 pi r. Okay? It would be um, 2 pi hyperbolic sine of the over c. So it would be larger than 2 pi r. And it was uh, ex tried to be explained by the fact that uh, when the circle is set into motion, the disk is set into motion, the number of rulers put at the periphery of the disk become contracted. And in the contraction of the disk, you need more rulers. Therefore, it's greater than 2 pi r. The same effect is uh, seen by the fact that the area is also greater than pi 
R squared. Okay? All these things are greater. If you look at the brightness of the star, the energy per unit area, if it was, um, if I call this S the area, then the brightness of the star would be 1 over S. Okay? And if S, the surface area, was gre is greater in hyperbolic space than it is in Euclidean space, we would see stars are not so bright as they should be. And that would be another indication that the system may seem further away, and therefore it would be hyperbolic space that we were talking about. So these things were avoided and, tried to, and were tried to be explained by Euclidean geometry, which ran into paradoxes. Okay? Some of the paradoxes is, is if a person is sitting uh, on the periphery and is rotating, his watch, <coughs> according to Einstein, would go slower than a person sitting here at the center of the uh, disk. This is not possible because the person, there is no means of uh, identifying the position of the person on the disk. His, uh, his clocks would shrink or go slower uh, as he would. And this was put into a very interesting analogy by Poincaré, who dealt with um, an evenly heated body. That is, he considered the temperature at any point P equal to the distance to the surface minus R squared at any point P. This is the distance if this is R, and this is R, uh, lowercase r. So here he was uh, saying that the first is R is a Euclidean measure of the distance. The linear dynamics vary with temperature. And all material bodies assume the temperature uh, of their localities. Because as P goes further to the surface, P is a nickname for Poincaré, who is an inhabitant of this uh, disk. He will see that uh, he shrinks, feels colder as he approaches the boundary. He cannot detect any temperature change because the locality in which he's moving, the temperature, uh, his thermometer becomes equilibrated with the temperature surrounding him. So he will not notice any difference in temperature. He cannot detect any uh, any change in his clock, because the clock slows down as his heartbeat slows down. So P's universe, Poincaré's universe, seems infinite to him. That is, he will always, it will take an infinite amount of time for him to approach the, um, the disk. So in this sense, we see that the phenomena that we expect to see uh, us Euclideans looking at the hyperbolic disk and what the inhabitants of the disk are two different things. They don't see the bending of geodesics, the shortest paths. We do from, uh, from afar. So the thing is, is that uh, where does the velocity of light come in? Uh, well, it wasn't a 20th century science which introduced the fact that the um, energy of a body tends to become infinite. That is, if I try to explain the increase in energy as the system approaches C, the velocity of light, I would have energy against V, the velocity. And this would rise because E is equal to m c squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared. So as v approaches c, this becomes infinite at c. So we would have one type of particles. This is the way um, it is usually explained. One type of particle, which can always approaches but never reaches the speed of light, it becomes infinitely heavy. It needs an infinite amount of work to be done. Then the second type of particles here, which is at the speed of light, those are the only ones known are photons, 
because they have no mass. And then there's a third category of particles, which are greater than the speed of light. Okay? This becomes negative. The square root of a negative number becomes imaginary. We want the energy to become real. So these particles have an imaginary mass. Okay? I am. If M is real. So these faster than light particles, if I tilt this a little bit this way, you'll see that to get to a particle, uh, to get to energies close to C, we have to do a lot of work. For these other particles on this side, as they approach C, no work has to be done. Actually, they give off work because of the fact that um, uh, they are approaching C from the opposite side. So whatever we explain on one side, you get a mirror image of the other side. This was known as far back as uh, the early 1800s when they were trying to put a theory together on electromagnetism. Uh, they, or better yet Weber, noticed that the velocity of light, or what they didn't know was the velocity of light at the time, was a ratio of two electrical constants. One appearing in Coulomb's law between two charges, and one appearing in Ampere's law. J1 and J2, and DS1 is the element of length of one of the uh, elements which are in motion, which, not in motion, but which are, this is DS1 and DS2. So this law does not depend only on the inverse square, but it depends upon the orientation of the ele electrical elements. Okay? This law was looked, frowned upon because Ampere's law upset Newton's law. Newton's law held sway for about 100, over 100 years, meaning that it was symmetrical. In every direction you looked, it was 1 over r squared. Here, Ampere comes in and says, no, it depends also on the angles between the elements. Okay? This law was uh, frowned upon by people like Faraday, uh, David Faraday, Michael Faraday, and was even went so far to be abolished, thrown out, until it met the eye of Gauss on the continent. And Gauss was intrigued with this. His student, uh, assistant, Weber, from this started to arrive at a formula for uh, the motion of two charges, and so set up a molecular theory of electricity. And what he came up with was that the force, when it's in motion, is K, Q1, Q2, over R squared. V squared. Okay? This ratio here is, this, uh, is 1 over C squared times 2. It's greater than C uh, by the factor of the square root of 2, okay? Now look at this. If Q1 and Q2 are attractive, uh, uh, charged uh, plus and minus, then the force becomes smaller and smaller as V approaches this quantity, such that when V is equal to this quantity, the force between the uh, attractive force vanishes. And when it's larger than this quantity, what was attracted becomes repulsive. And this was no problem for them. That is, going from attraction to repulsion. This was done 
uh, this was known uh, by uh, Heaviside. It is Heaviside was working on uh, the theory of the theory of uh, Thomson, in which Thomson knew as far back as 1881 that when a charge is set into motion, it produced a magnetic field. And this magnetic field tried to retard the motion of the particle. So it seemed like there was an increase in inertia of the particle due to the magnetic field. Now people like Olkin say that, uh, well, this was completely static because it didn't involve uh, a finite velocity. True, Heaviside pushed it much further took it all the way to infi uh, the uh, velocity of light and beyond, okay? Now, he's, uh, according to him, there should be no fear in infinities, as he called it. That is, uh, going beyond the velocity of light, there was really no problem, and gave an example. If I take a negative charge and push it towards the speed of light, he said, and I take a positive charge and do the same thing, the two effects will balance one another, and the infinity will disappear. This is not really true, but the idea is that they were thinking of superluminal uh, particles as far back as 1889, long before relativity became uh, it was born. So the thing now is that uh, how do we measure uh, distance? Okay, the problem is. Uh, to measure distance in all of these things. So we've used first the fact that aberration is a phenomenon which can be explained by hyperbolic geometry, not by uh, Euclidean geometry. The other effect is the Doppler effect. According to Felix Klein definition of distance, if I have a distance between two points, Z1 and Z2, which can be complex numbers. The distance is related to the ratio of the two, divided by the logarithm of a certain constant. This is the constant, universal constant, needed to define the geometry. So he introduced a new definition of distance, D. And if we let Z1 equal to C plus U, and Z2 equal to C minus U, with C, U is the velocity, then we obtain and set um, lambda, a logarithm of lambda equal to 1 over C, we obtain C equals logarithm divided by 2, C plus U over C minus U. Okay. C over 2 is the 1 over logarithm of this. The distance now is not in space, but in velocity space. And if we look at it as uh, C logarithm of C plus U over C minus U to the 1 half, we will see that it is a logarithm of the longitudinal Doppler effect which determines the distance. So everything is included in this factor. U can be a composite velocity, meaning that U, would, in this case, would be identified with W prime. And what we would obtain is a product of Doppler shifts. So we can build up any velocity uh, by a product of Doppler shifts. So the important point here is that the Doppler effect is really what determines the distance. Okay? I haven't mentioned space or time. Space and time are not unified. What is unified is the difference of space over time, which is the velocity. Okay? And the velocity are constant. In so, at this point, one can rightly ask, well, how do I know, how do I get 
uh, uh, a Doppler effect because here I'm increasing the velocity over that of light. Okay? So I'm really going to a velocity, C plus U. So if C is the uh, limiting velocity, then there should be no uh, Doppler shift, Doppler shifts. Okay? So here I'll put a bar on top of this to distinguish the hyperbolic velocity from the Euclidean velocity. Okay? We know that the uh, frequency times wavelength is equal to C. Okay? If you want C to be a constant and there's a frequency shift, uh, uh, then there must be a corresponding decrease in the wavelength to keep C constant. If this means that electromagnetic vibrations are not due to a medium like the ether, but they are due to the self-contained oscillations of the electromagnetic fields which are propagated by them. So in this sense, that if I hold on to the fact that uh, C is a universal constant, then the frequencies which I obtain must have a decrease of wavelength. This is not true of uh, this is not true of sound, for instance. Okay, sound I can have this disturbance propagating. So I would keep lambda constant, but then fre the frequency would change because the waves are coming at me faster or slower than the source is putting out. So in this sense, is that sound is a phenomena in which the velocity of sound is not constant. And this we know because of uh, jets which surpass the velocity of sound, they have a sonic boom. Okay? And heavy side thought the same thing could happen to uh, electromagnetic waves. And he, uh, this would be the fact that uh, the medium, that the disturbance would be propagate faster than the disturbance of the medium. Anyone traveling in a, in a speedboat would see conical waves coming out when the speedboat was surpassing the velocity of the, of the water it's traveling in. So he predicted, in a certain sense, Cherenkov radiation, which was not known until 1934, by this, uh, by, discovered by Cherenkov, which means this, is that in the denominator, you have 1 over v squared sine of theta. Okay? In the denominator of these uh, uh, electric magnetic fields, when this becomes zero, okay, uh, you can get, and it, if the angle is equal to the sine of C over N, V, where N is the index of refraction. Cherenkov radiation works because it's not the velocity of light involved, but the velocity of the medium light is traveling in. So we're not suppressing the speed of light here. So in this sense is that I can have a, a, a charge which is traveling at constant velocity, it comes within a canonical, this cone, by this angle, it starts to radiate energy. And this means that the radiation coming out is, uh, is due to the fact that the velocity has become uh, greater than C over N, in this case. So, Heaviside predicted this as far back as 1897, and it wasn't discovered for another 30 years. Uh, you think that they would acknowledge Heaviside, the authors? No. He got no acknowledgement from this. So, um, another problem is this, is that why is there, if, uh, why can't the velocity of light be surpassed, even in Euclidean space? And uh, a Swiss scientist came up with the idea that if I shoot a projectile out of a cannon ball, it will have the velocity of light with respect to the cannon. And if the cannon is traveling at velocity c, then 
I should have c plus v as a velocity, okay? And he assumed that at each point in, uh, along the trajectory, you would have these fictitious particles being emitted, much like sound waves. So in this case, you would not get uh, a constant velocity of light, but something more like sound. So uh, why did he come to these conclusions? Well. Uh, Poincaré and Einstein based relativity on Maxwell's equations. Okay? Now, Maxwell's equations are reversible. They contain solutions also which make no sense because they contain retarded and advanced potentials. You can understand retarded potentials meaning the fact that the configuration of the system now depends upon the past configuration of the system. But that's a retarded potential. Then the fact is, is that if it also includes the advanced potential, that means that the future influences the present, which is unphysical. So according to Ritz, uh, it's not Maxwell's equations which need to be looked at, but rather the potentials which give rise to Maxwell's equations, and that the um, advanced potentials must, must be eliminated because they're unphysical. And plus the fact that how can uh, Maxwell's equations, which are reversible, describe the irreversible process of radiation. Okay? So, uh, this got uh, into a debate between Einstein and, um, and uh, Ritz because Einstein had to hold on to the Fitzhugh formula, okay? Because that was the addition of velocities which was required by special relativity. Ritz didn't need that. So in a certain sense, Einstein had to hold on to Maxwell's theory and had to admit the possibility of advanced and retarded potentials, okay? And that it was the fields themselves which are the important quantities, and not the potentials which produce the fields. So this got into a debate, and uh, in the end, they agreed to dis disagree. Okay? Uh, Einstein used a statistical argument to show that advanced and uh, retarded potentials were needed, uh, many particles were needed, and this got into difficulty because the equations are not probabilistic in nature, they're deterministic. So, in the sense is that uh, uh, Ritz's theory held good until about 1913 when Desitter was looking at a binary star, an eclipse binary star, two stars rotating about each other. So, if I have one star, uh, rotating about another star, then light coming from approaching uh, the observer would see, would travel in a time, less time, than receding from another observer. Okay? And these two images, these two rays, would at a certain point intersect and produce a spurious, a spurious eccentricity, or have two objects seen at different points in space. This was not known, this was not seen, and this was meant the death knell of uh, emission theories, that emission theories did not hold. Why you look at space was that all Earth measurements were to and fro. You needed the system to come back to observe. Here you could observe, uh, would be a first order effect, not a second order effect. It was to and fro will lead to second order effects in V over C squared, whereas observations from um, space would be first order V over C. Then came the, the problem that, well, maybe because the sitter wasn't observing the velocities themselves, but something else. Why? Because uh, no matter how rare space is, there is a gaseous cloud that light has to pass through. And 
what they call an extinction length, means that light forgets the wavelength it had beforehand, and there's a tendency for, for all the speeds to cluster around the speed of light. So if light has to pass through another medium, it takes the characteristic of that medium, and therefore uh, we're not observing the real emission of light from the star itself, but from the intervening space around it. But uh, to all intended purposes, uh, emission theories have been done away with. So, uh, in any case, uh, he came up with the fact is that the velocity of light will be C plus KV, where K is equal to 0 0.002. 0, 0, a very small number. So, uh, emission theories were later discounted for completely. I guess this takes care of the fact that uh, actually you need two velocities depending upon what we're observing in which frame in geometry we're observing from. So in the sense is that systems can go faster than the speed of light would just mean that we're, what we're observing is not the Euclidean velocity but the hyperbolic one. 